What is left for us humans after the digital revolution is done with us? Uh, in the framework that we pursue here in this specialization and this course, we have this human component. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Well, if you open the newspapers nowadays, you can see that many people are extremely concerned that we will be replaced. Our jobs will be replaced. We as humans will be replaced. Famously, we call ourselves the Homo sapiens. Uh, the, the the human that knows, actually the homo sapiens that knows that they know. And now we created machines that automated the process of knowledge production. And that's a big one, if you are a homo sapiens, because supposedly you are the one who is in charge of that knowledge business. And now we automated that with machines. So that is hits us a lot in our pride, in our anthropocentric <laughs> Pride, of course, as the human uh, of the center of the universe, and it creates a lot of anxiety. Now, it is truth very certain that I do not know, and nobody knows, if this will go well, uh, because this is unprecedented. We never created machines that are better than us in knowledge production, in figuring things out. Now, what this course and this specialization is about is to use innovation theory the patterns that have been in the past in order to see if we can find some patterns that can help us to guide and to socially construct this paradigm. It's very true that it's unprecedented, but it's also very true that things have always been unprecedented. It's not like previous technological revolutions uh, repeated old things. They were always completely new things that were absolutely scary. And also this situation here repeated itself. For example, if you go back to the industrial revolutions, there were the Luddites, which destroyed industrial machinery because industrial machinery replaced them in their sense of human. Their sense of human was to contribute with labor. So what I want to invite you to here in this, also saying like, I don't know if things are going well, but we can learn from history, from innovation theory, especially what it has to offer. So let's let's go. Let's open the big curtain again of you know technological revolution since the beginning of humankind, and we had several here where we transformed matter, we transformed energy, and now we're in this meta paradigm where we transform uh, information. And let's pick one. Let's pick the one with the water. Maybe the first what they call industrial revolutions. We used a machine in order to start to dominate energy. Well, it came with steam and with electricity, became better and better at it, but that kind of like was one of the beginnings. So there were several civilizations that really were thriving on that. Now, what they were doing, these civilizations, is they used what Hayek, very influential economist, he wrote this very interesting essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society. Highly recommend it. It's very readable. And what Hayek says, that well, this is what these civilizations did. That's what always happens. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which, can, which we can perform without thinking about them. So what were these civilizations performing without thinking about them? So there's two of them ancient, very famous civilizations, the Khmer in what is today Thailand and Cambodia, and uh, the Incas in what is today is mainly is Peru. Two different sides of the world, but they were both agricultural societies. So most of the people there were employed basically in carrying buckets of water to water the rice fields. So they had to go to the river, take the buckets of water and carry them back. And that was basically, I mean, I'm simplifying now, but that was the main uh, employment. So what they both did, what was the big innovation is they automated the process. They create what the, the Khmer called the Barayas, what the Incas called aqueductus. So they created this machinery that automated this process. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which can, which we can perform without thinking about them. So they basically with that made the majority of the people obsolete from dusk till dawn because basically people were carrying bucket of water all their life. So what did they do then? Well, they had a lot of free time on their hand, a lot of free time on their hand. 
Now, what they do with the free time, well, the, the similar conversation we have nowadays, what are we going to do when you're all in, um, unemployed with universal income and so forth? But, you know, these things, I'm telling these stories because these things happened before and innovation theory can help us to see, you know, what happened. So what happened then when they were suddenly all from dusk till dawn unemployed? Well, they had a lot of free time on their hand and didn't know really what to do with it. So some of them, they were so bored, they started to like, look at the skies. And what came of it is astronomy, or also astrology. <laughs> but they started to make a science of, of looking, looking at the stars. Others, they were so bored instead of only like building caves and living in huts, they started to build what until today is the biggest architectural structures that we, that we have. Angkor Wat is until nowadays, the biggest that's a construction that the Khmers did in, in nowadays is Cambodia. The biggest construction I think that was ever built. At Machu Picchu, amazing constructions. I mean, you have to have a lot of free time on your hand to push architecture to such limits that actually we never repeated until now. Um, other things, the Incas started to invent written language. They had these, these keepers, these knots, this knot system that they used for recording. And therefore, with written language, inventing literature and whatever came of it, uh, poetry and so forth. Others, they were so bored, they started to organize standing armies and attack neighboring civilizations. I mean, you have to be very bored to come up with stuff like that. <laughs> so, so, but that's how civilization advances, basically. So we create, we create, you know, this freedom in time that we don't use anymore. And that time it was, we liberate ourselves from a lot of manual labor, right? And that, that created a surplus of free time uh, of what we can then do other things. Now, this one here is a little bit different. We're liberating ourselves from a lot of cognitive labor. And that will also very likely give us a lot of free time. So let's look at an example of, of, of how that has happened also with something that is a little bit further ago. And it was characterized, I remember, as it was the last stand of humanity. We send our best one, our chess grandmaster, Kasparov himself, to fight this machine. IBM had this machine. It wasn't even like a deep neural net of a transformer layer. Not none of that, none of that modern stuff. It was just like a brute force, big machine. And it played chess against Kasparov. And long story short, the last stand of man didn't go well. I mean, that was like 30 years ago or more, right? So, uh, no, we lost. And that went pretty bad. So now Kasparov had basically three options. Uh, he could go on a crusade and say, turn off, shut off all the computers, the Luddites that went and destroyed all the machines and says, shut it all down. Or he could have gone, you know, in, in the mountains or in the desert and hide and say like, oh my goodness, like that's the end, right? And just like, be the one who tries to survive, but he, he didn't do any of that. What he did is he created something that is called advanced chess or cyborg chess or centaur chess or freestyle chess. It's really freestyle. He's like, you can bring whatever you want. You know, it's, it's freestyle. It's a matter like, let's say, okay, everything allowed. Bring your computer if you want, like whatever, like pump yourself up with whatever you want. You come in here and do freestyle chess. And it's very interesting what he is finding in this freestyle chess. The one who wins is not the supercomputers. It's also not the grandmasters that win. And most interestingly, it's also not the grandmasters with the supercomputers that win in these kind of freestyle chess tournament. What Kasparov tells us is that a weak human in a machine, but a better process of collaboration was superior than a strong computer alone and more remarkably, superior to a strong human in machine and an inferior process. So even if you have a strong computer at chess grandmaster with a machine, but they don't collaborate well, then you're not doing as well. Shrink us back to one of the personalities we already had in, in, in today's lectures, Professor John von Neumann. And Professor von Neumann told us that the best we can do is to divide all processes into those things which, which can be better done by machines, and those which can be done better by humans, and then invent methods to pursue the two. So basically what he's saying in these kind of collaborations is we have to invent methods to collaborate between them. And that's actually what innovation theory teaches us. So the Incas, they liberated themselves from a lot of manual labor and invented written language, these knots, which then helped them to actually push the agricultural 
to production to a new level because now they had a rudimentary storage of information. They could record how the weather was going. They were looking at the stars. The Khmer had these amazing architectural structures that would help them to really expand also the agricultural production. So you start to collaborate with them. You start to do new things. And the stuff that is automated before that you liberate yourself from, you collaborate with what the machines can do better. Well, back in the days, they were better at, at watering rice fields than us carrying buckets of water. And we are doing new things in order to collaborate with the machines and going, going uh, beyond that. And you can also see that at a very good example is that once we do that, by the way, also like, you know, it's not, it's not like we, we, we then uh, get rid of what the machine has solved. We actually get more fascinated with it. In this paradigm, what happened with chess is that the machine taught us new ways of playing chess, more efficiently, that motivate a lot of new people. Chess is much more popular now than it has ever been. If you look at chess.com with 100 million users, I mean, chess has been extremely popular. Like people don't, if you look at the research, people don't remember a time where as many people as frequently have been playing chess. Even so, supposedly, it has been solved by a machine. 30 years ago. So the machine actually made it very attractive to play with us. Interestingly, we don't watch two machines playing each other. We don't. We actually, because we also wouldn't understand, we collaborate with the machine and we play with the machine or we learn from the machine to play with each other. And that's actually, that's actually what we do. Now let's go to a more, a more advanced example, a more advanced game that shows the power of machine learning, where the machine actually shows us new ways of, of really doing things. This is example is about a game called Go, which is more complex than chess. Uh, the number of possible moves in Go, 250 per turn, is, if you put them all up, it's a, it's a number with 360 zeros. That's a very big number. I cannot even pronounce it. There are, the number of possible atoms in the universe is only <laughs> a number with 80 zeros. So even if you would take every atom in the universe and compute it, com convert it into the hardware for a computer. I mean, you cannot brute force compute all the possible moves in Go. You need, you know, you need that thing that is so uniquely human, this intuition, this gut feeling, this creativity that we thought machines wouldn't have. And so we send one of our best, the Korean grandmaster Lee Sedol, to play this machine from Google DeepMind, uh, AlphaGo, it's called, a, a deep learning network and they played this game and a series of games. The first one the machine lost uh, and now it was the second game. And then the machine made this famous move, the move 37. And all the experts in the room, many experts of Go of course, all like all, all together talking about it and everybody thought like no human player would have made this move. They were always like, what is that? Like now the machine gave up. Yay, team human, he's gonna come back and he's gonna win. The machine basically gave up with this move. Now, our grandmaster actually just sat there for a long time. And then he finally got up, went outside to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> and people thought like, what? what is he doing? Like, what's going on? And he understood that something was funny here. Something, he later said, this, this, move, this move was not human, right? There's like something was, was going on here that was not correct. And then he came back to basically lose the game with, with, with some grace. But then later on, they studied that move and they discovered that it showed them a completely different dimension of the game that for the last few thousand years, we, we hadn't discovered yet. The machine actually, back, and what to us seemed like a, 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 a move that didn't make any sense, actually opened up, saw a macro view to this entire game that people are still studying. So the machine showed us a more entertaining way, a different way of looking at a game that the best and the brightest have played for thousands of years and haven't, haven't figured it out. So, so if we go back to John von Neumann and ask, what can machines do better in the knowledge age? Well, they show us new ways of doing things. They explore the possibilities and they show us new ways of doing so. We can say like, okay, how can you solve this equation? Um, we saw before, you can solve it this way or you can solve it that way. And we can give it also you know, more intricate problems, how to solve the world problems. And we humans also do that, the homo sapiens, the homo sapiens, sapiens, of course. Uh, well, some of us do it and we put them on a pedestal, right? When, when, when they create new ways of doing it. Copernicus and Newton have showed us new ways of looking at the universe. George Washington and the, the founders, the founding fathers here in America of the French Revolution showed us a new way of organizing society through democracy, representative 
democracy. Ada Lovelace showed us how to program a computer. And Darwin, Edison, Marie Curie, Henry Ford, Albert Einstein, these are all people that showed us a new way of doing things. And we put them on a pedestal because then the rest of us is like, oh yeah, Henry Ford, that's how you can organize that. Oh yeah, Edison. Oh, that's how you make light of electricity. It's a light bulb. Now we can all do that. Thank you for showing us a new way of doing things. But it's been far in between. These of us that show us new ways of doing things. So what happens now in the artificial intelligence age is that this becomes the focus. Figuring out puzzle solving of new ways of doing things. And what that means is that the knowledge process becomes to a certain degree commodified. It becomes a commodity. We automated that thing, right? And that means also that these processes, these cognitive, especially routines, they become commodified. And you can already see that in the incipient statistics. Theoretically, we'll go later to it, but you can see it also in empirical evidence. If you look at the salary, the wage increases, this is from Germany, what they call Industry 4.0. And you can see here that the wages actually for analytic, for interactive, even for manual routine labor have increased thanks to automation of Industry 4.0, which is you know the intelligence evolution of, of the industry. Because even manual labor now powered by the machines can do more. Humans can do more with their manual labor, they, they have a better way of doing things, and therefore they deserve more wages. The only, where, the only sector where wages decrease are cognitive routines. Now that's from Europe, here's from the United States, and we can see a similar pattern. Non-cognitive routines become much more valuable. Cognitive routines become less valuable. And this process of commodifying routines actually has happened in previous technological revolutions. So let's again take back the big curtain and let's go to previous uh, revolutions when we started to dominate matter. Now that was kind of like an alchemy, it was magic that we converted some raw material into bronze, into iron, for example. But, you know, in the meantime, we even figured out the periodic table and made a chemistry out of it and we produced metal and plastics and paper and glass like nobody's business. It became a routine. Like back in the days, it was it was basically magic. I mean, we were just animals. <laughs> and but in contrast to the other animals, we manipulated matter. Right? We created new matter. Now, nowadays, I mean it's like you, you rattle down the periodic table and you mix in this and this, and you create well, whatever new plastic you want to create. Basically, it's puzzle solving. It became a routine, the manipulation of matter. Not all, not all, and we're still learning. So these evolutions are also ongoing of course, with nanotechnology and so forth. But basically, these kind of matters that we talked about there, there, a lot of these have become routines. The same in what we call the industrial revolutions. I mean, that was pretty scary at the beginning when we had electricity and so forth. But a lot of these routine carrying buckets of water, carrying things like, you know, we took care of that. And we automated the number of important operations and we can carry heavy things now on trains and on cars and with you know energetic uh, electric power we do that and now something similar happens with information information processes and knowledge processes are becoming routine the, the ones that can become routine are becoming routine now there is still non-routine manual labor, if you go back to this one here, right? So there's still a good carpenter that has a lot of power tools on their hands, but they can make amazing things. And the same here, what we are seeing is some knowledge processes are getting commodified. To use the words again of Hayek, you know, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations, which we can perform without thinking about them. Now, what we do now, and this is true, it's never been there before, we perform thinking operations without thinking about them. <laughs> I don't know if Hayek's words were exactly the best choice, but you know, it makes it interesting. So yes, look, I don't know if it's gonna end well, and I don't know if it's completely different. What I know from innovation theory is these technological revolutions have always been unprecedented. Uh, and, and sometimes they put us to the border of, of extinction. I mean, this one here with the internal combustion engine, you know, the exhaust we created and the global warming, we still don't know 
if he might not have created a negative side effect that might actually, you know, give us a big ding in, in, in human evolution. Because we just created that and the negative side effect is still like ongoing, even so that was, you know, a few hundred years ago, a hundred years ago. Uh, right now, we, we warmed up the globe. Some people say maybe too much. We don't know. So it's a dangerous game. Technological evolution is a dangerous game. Now, I don't know if it's going to end well or how it's going to end, but I can also see like, it's not completely, like it's always been new. It's never been that history repeated itself. But what we can see here from, from precedents is that yes, we take something, an operation, and we make it a routine by putting it into technology. And look, as if I, if I look at my day, my day is full of cognitive routines. Like it's full of cognitive routines. Like what exactly makes me feel human and sitting in a car in traffic for an hour a day? Like if a car can self-drive, like there's nothing really inherently or uh, answering these emails or cleaning up databases. I mean, if an AI cannot answer these emails and cleaners, I mean, yes, of course, there are moments that you, you really feel human when I inspire a student or when you feel the love of your family and so forth. But it's, and it's scary that, you know, because we are, these cognitive routines, they are our buckets of water. And most of the day, we're carrying these intellectual buckets of water. And that's what's being becoming automated. Now, what are we going to make out of it? I, I don't know, and nobody knows. We're likely going to have a lot of time on our hands, and we're going to create a lot of richness, a lot of wealth being created, how it's going to be distributed, who is going to benefit from it, how are we are going to safeguard it. All of that is part of the social construction of reality. And while we don't know if it's going to go well, what we can do is take up the responsibility to socially construct it. And I hope this course and some of the things I share today also help you and motivate you to join this discussion and help us to socially construct and making sure that this technology will make this world a better place. Thank you very much for your attention.